While slavery is a well-known historical atrocity, what happened after its abolition is often less discussed. After slavery was officially abolished in many countries, including the United States in 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment, some plantation owners resorted to a new and disturbing practice known as slave breeding farms. Slave breeding farms were establishments where enslaved women and men were systematically forced to procreate in order to produce more enslaved individuals. It was a desperate and cruel attempt by plantation owners to maintain their economic interests and dominance over the newly freed African-American population. During the years following abolition, plantation owners faced a challenge. They needed a constant workforce to sustain their agricultural operations, as their economic prosperity relied heavily on coerced labor. With the cessation of the international slave trade, which had previously supplied new enslaved individuals, plantation owners turned to slave breeding farms as a way to produce a new generation of slaves. These farms were essentially breeding centers where enslaved men and women were selected and paired together at times based on their physical traits to produce children. Plantation owners had no choice but to introduce such farms as they needed to replace the workforce lost through emancipation and ensure a continuous supply of enslaved laborers. The impacts on the enslaved individuals subjected to this practice were profound and devastating. They were stripped of their autonomy and treated as breeding stock, reduced to mere objects for reproduction. Enslaved women were particularly targeted, as they were viewed as a valuable source for increasing the number of enslaved individuals. To force enslaved individuals into breeding, plantation owners resorted to various methods, including rape and sexual violence. Enslaved women were often subjected to sexual exploitation against their will, with no consideration for their consent or well-being. Some Disturbing Facts About Slave Breeding Farms Fact Number 1. The slaves were bred just like cattle. Enslaved men and women were often selected by slave owners and forced into sexual relationships for the purpose of producing more enslaved individuals. Owners viewed this practice as a means to increase their stock of enslaved laborers, who were considered valuable property for their economic interests. The comparison between the breeding of enslaved people and livestock reflects the deeply degrading and inhumane treatment endured by enslaved individuals. The practice treated them as mere objects, devoid of agency and personal autonomy. Fact number two. Slave owners often used rape as a means of impregnating enslaved women. Tragically, slave owners commonly resorted to sexual violence, including rape, to impregnate enslaved women. This reprehensible act was a means for slave owners to exert control over the reproduction process. Some notable cases here include the case of Sally Hemings, an enslaved house servant owned by Thomas Jefferson. Hemings was just 14 years old when Thomas Jefferson had his way with her and it is known that he fathered six of Hemings' children, out of which only four survived to adulthood. We also know about the case of 19-year-old Celia, who was repeated raped by her owner Robert Newsom until one night when she could no longer take. The pain and humiliation fatally clubbed her master as he approached her in her cabin which led to his death. She was eventually sentenced to death even though her act was out of self-defense from a rapist. Fact number 3. Male slaves were forced to father children with their daughters and sisters. At breeding farms, healthy and strong enslaved men were forced to have sex with women to get them pregnant. The white slave masters did not care if these women were the mothers, daughter or relatives of the men and the men were made to have sex with at least six women a day to increase the possibility of the number of women who got pregnant. A very well-known example is the case of Patasika, a huge man with a height of 7 feet and a weight of about 300 pounds. He was named a slave breeder and forced to procreate with other slave women to produce children who would be slaves from birth. This led him to sire over 200 children in his lifetime. Fact number 4. Enslaved women were often forced to have children at a young age and were expected to continue having children throughout their lives. These poor women were subjected to the harsh reality of early and continuous childbirth. Enslaved women tended to give birth to their first child at a relatively young age and have short intervals between births, in part due to a lack of contraception, 
but also because of the pressures placed upon women by slaveholders who were ever anxious to keep their slave population increasing without the purchase of new people, they were forced to bear children from a young age and were expected to reproduce throughout their lives. Some of them had numerous stillbirths while others pregnant women and their young children were susceptible to environmental and medical factors that led to death on antebellum plantations. Many women gave birth to mixed race or what used to be called mulatto children following sexual assaults at the hands of white men, and while white women sometimes regarded these children with hostility, they were both loved and accepted within enslaved communities themselves. Fact number 5. Children born to enslaved women were considered property and were often sold away from their mothers. Tragically, after forcing these women to give birth to numerous the relationship between mother and child was often abused. These plantation owners viewed all children born to enslaved women were as property, not as human beings with inherent rights. Slave owners had the authority to sell these children, often at a young age, separating them from their mothers and disrupting familial bonds. The risk of sale in the international slave trade peaked between the ages of 15 and 25, but the vulnerability of being sold began as early as age 8 and certainly by the age of 10, when enslaved children could work competently on the fields. This heart-wrenching separation caused immense suffering and trauma for both the mothers and their children. Margaret Garner's story symbolizes the plight of women and children under slavery. In January 1856, she fled with her husband and four children, some sources say that she had six children, from her owner in Kentucky. The Garners Successfully crossed the Ohio River near Cincinnati, but a group of slave owners found the family shortly thereafter. Before the slaveholders captured the fugitive slaves, Margaret Garner used a butcher knife to kill her young daughter. Garner also tried to kill her other children, but she was unsuccessful in her attempt. Garner did not want her children returned to a life of slavery. This is how desperate a mother could go to rather than have her children go back into slavery. Fact number 6. The children of enslaved women were often used as collateral for loans. The children of enslaved women were treated as valuable commodities, even serving as collateral for loans. Slave owners could use these children as assets to secure credit or borrow money, further deepening the dehumanization and exploitation of enslaved people. One example of a situation where children of enslaved women were used as collateral for loans is the practice of pawnship also known as pawn slavery. This practice was prevalent in some southern states in the United States during the era of slavery. Under pawnship, enslaved people were used as collateral for loans. When an enslaved woman needed money, her owner would offer her and her children as security for the loan. If the owner failed to repay the debt, the lender would then take possession of the enslaved woman and her children and sell them to recoup the loan amount. This practice created a deeply unsettling situation for enslaved women and their children. They were not only subjected to the hardships of slavery but also faced the constant threat of being separated from their families and sold as a result of their owner's financial obligations. Fact number 7. The children of enslaved women were often subjected to brutal treatment, including physical and sexual abuse. The children born as a result of slave breeding were vulnerable to various forms of abuse. They were subjected to physical and sexual violence, reflecting the oppressive and dehumanizing nature of slavery. These innocent children suffered immensely under a system that perpetuated their exploitation and denied them their basic human rights. Slave children, under their parents and masters, lived in fear of punishment and isolation. Though circumstances widely varied, they often worked in fields with adults, tended animals, cleaned and served in their owners' houses, and took care of younger children while their parents were working. Fact number 8. Slave breeding was a profitable business for slave owners, who could sell the children of enslaved women for a high price. Slave breeding was driven by economic motives. Slave owners recognized that the children of enslaved women could be sold for significant sums of money. The sale of these children served as a lucrative source of profit, perpetuating the inhumane and morally bankrupt enterprise of slavery. Fact number 9. The practice of slave breeding was not limited to the United States, it was also common in other parts of the world where slavery was legal. 
While the focus here is on the United States, it is important to acknowledge that the practice of slave breeding was not unique to that country. In regions where slavery was legal, such as other parts of the Americas and various parts of the world, similar practices of forced breeding were embraced as a means to sustain and expand the institution of slavery. Slave breeding was the practice in all slave states, including the United States used by all slave owners to systematically force the reproduction of slaves to increase their profits. The legacy of slave breeding continues to impact African American communities today as many individuals are descendants of those who endured this horrific practice. Recognizing the historical realities of slave breeding is crucial in understanding the deep-rooted traumas and injustices faced by African Americans, and in working towards a more equitable and just society.